spoke all night. He lurked in the shadows, waiting and hoping she wouldn't take a different room. This was a usual room. He knew that. He knew her. Ghost of Me, the new book by Amanda Steele, can be found at Amazon, Kobo, Waterstones, and many, many other places. Spoke all night. Hi guys, it's Andy N. Thanks today for downloading or streaming yet another episode of Spoken Label. As you may or may not be aware, Spoken Label was started in the beginning of 2006, and currently we have well over 150 sessions recorded and sent. Although you can find it on various networks, the full archive is available for streaming and downloading at Spoken Label. Full stop bandcamp.com. It is a free download or free stream in there. But obviously, if you feel like chucking me a few pennies that way, it'd be eternally grateful to help me keep this podcast going and keep improving my equipment, etc. Enjoy. Speak to you soon. Bye bye. Spoken Label. Hi guys, Andy N. Spoken Label. Back in the house again and on Zoom tonight. Right, this is um, the gentleman I've got with me is a very special guest today. Because he's one of the original people I interviewed over four years ago now. We were just talking about this on on Zoom um, before we were. And it's been, I first started Spoken Label off in January 2016. And three months later, a gentleman on Zoom with tonight, Dave Hartley, was my fourth guest. The first time I interviewed somebody remotely. And because he's such mm. a major influence and big help to me over the years, I've had to bring in the heavyweight artillery to help me out today. And who's that? I'm I've got the boss in with me as well, so because she knows Dave well. Dave, obviously, like, obviously, as we know you, in case anybody that doesn't know you, there may be the odd person to in the world. Do you want to tell everybody, everybody very obviously, we'll keep it brief, we'll touch on what you've been doing since last we spoke. But tell, go to tell people very briefly who you are, and very obviously where all your creativity originally came from, and what started from there. Yeah, okay. Hello, hello, all listeners. Um, thanks very much for that introduction, Andy and Amanda. It's uh, really nice to be back. Um, yeah, so who am I? So I'm Dave Hartley, and I am a writer. I've been writing for about a decade now, actually, about 10 years properly. Um, mostly short fiction, um, I tend to do. I'm sort of known for like we- very weird short <laughs> stories, quite Not weird true. and dark and odd and strange. And I've had various bits and pieces published in various places down the years on websites and magazines and so on. Um, I, yeah, so I, I sort of first started writing back when I was an undergraduate university student about 10 years ago. And, um, but I've always been quite, I've always been a writer as such. I've always sort of um, enjoyed that process. Uh, I come from a, quite a creative family. My, my dad's a writer as well. He's a playwright uh, and he's written a few novels. Uh, so like the, the written word and books and so on were always a big part of our, uh, of my childhood. Um, and, uh, yeah. And so I've just, I sort of fallen into that over the last 10 years and I am currently, I'm currently a PhD student and I'm doing a creative writing PhD at the university of Manchester, which is coming to its end, hopefully, um, within the next six or seven months, which, uh, is, (laughs) Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. It's, yeah. it's, it's took a while to you to get this far in this one, hasn't it? It has. <laughs> yeah, it's slightly terrifying, but it's it's been an it's been an amazing uh, it's been an amazing four years, and yeah, it's such a privilege to be able to do it. But yeah, that's that's me at the moment in a nutshell, yeah. I guess. Now, when we first talked four years ago, this is where this is where it gets a bit strange. Now, the people won't know was at the time that four years ago you were running them Stratford's leading open mic this tonight, where you speak easy. Absolutely. Now, it makes it weirder now because like, four years later, I'm co-running it with a manager and a guy called Steve Smythe. <laughs> so, yep. but obviously, in your case, we were, we were backtracking date, weren't we? We reckon you stopped running Speakeasy in 2017-ish, didn't we? That's when your PhD so. started off, wasn't it? And yeah, then, that's how it. Yeah, that's how it all coordinated. I seem to remember. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I, I was doing Speakeasy for uh, probably about two two years, I think. Before I think my my run of it. Um, yeah, and I started it up at it, it's uh, Sip Club in, in Stratford. I knew Andy and Amanda and Steve and a f- handful of other people were kind of, I, I sort of thought of as my regulars. You would come pretty much every hard- every month. What's funny is, yeah. Steve, Steve calls them out hardcore regulars. It always cracks me up because we know you started that one. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. You were, and to be fair, like you guys kept the thing going, and it was so wonderful that I could have. It was. It's always really nice to have an audience that you can rely on being there every month. Like even every, you know, even when it came around, so like if I hadn't had as many people signed up, I'd always think, well, you know, there was is going to at least be an audience, and there will be an event happening. And it was, uh, it was really wonderful. It was such a great thing, and it, I was a bit sad when I had to finish it. You know, I had to stop it, um, but. The PhD was taking over, everything was changing in my head, and I just needed some headspace to be able to, to, to do that. Um, but yeah, it was delightful to be able to then hand Speakeasy over to Steve and Steve, yourself. I came on board, Amanda, after that. So it was like, yeah, it's been, it's been challenge, challenge for us to keep the successful night going, really. But that's what it's been yeah. a pleasure. Now, I know in your case, the bug, net, your bug bit you again, didn't it, a year later, when you set up it the big did. words where you got involved with your friend Ali McDowell's night, didn't you? Big words. Yes. Now, obviously, that night's not going at the moment. Tell people briefly what drew you to running, what is running on the night, then. Yeah, I know. I thought, after I'd finished with Speakeasy, I thought, okay, um, while that was fun, you know, you know, it, it, it takes up a lot of time and energy, as you'll know, um, month on, yeah. month by month. Um, and I thought, okay, I, I, I've done that now. I don't need to do another one. And then my friend Ali, who lives also in Stretford, or, or sort of lives around the corner in, in Furswood, um, he uh he's he's a he's an old friend who i knew from university and he's a he's a playwright and uh he was very keen to to start up a spoken word night and he'd been actually to speakeasy a few times he'd done a re few readings there i remember uh, him, so he, i remember him from that rather graphic short story he read and do you remember yes that? Yeah, there was, uh oh what was it about now it's about a relationship went wrong or something wasn't it and yeah he, he writes some, somebody terrifying. Got up, somebody got cut up the pieces of it rather crappy. Oh, it sounds like Man Kind of Storm, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah, really up your street, Amanda. Like, he writes the weirdest, darkest, strangest stories. Yeah, I think it's a, it was a story about a guy who's who meets his girlfriend's parents and then en ends up um, putting his foot in it somehow and he ends up just, like, turning himself inside out. It's a terrifying and horrible, but yeah, really brilliant, that. amazing story. Yeah, I thought you yeah. were, that's why, because I remember yeah. doing that one to speak easy. I don't know if we were dating on the line, Amanda. I remember doing that one again, and when it first we went to your third, that one time we went down to big words, and I was sat there thinking, "Yes, yes, I do remember Ali now." <laughs> I <can> see why. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, he's a great. He's a great writer. He's Ali. He's a really. He's an amazing guy. And um, yeah, he was just so keen to set this thing up. And so I sort of at this first, I was kind of sort of like, "Well, yeah, I'll, you know, I'll help, and I'll because uh, I can advise him on how to set something like this up. He'd never done it before." And we went and spoke to. Um, we went to to the to Vinyl Fiction, which is a which what was a bookshop and a record shop in Shorten, who were very very new at that time, and they were looking for um, people to do events in their shop. And we tripped in, and they said, "Well, we can do a spoken word night." And they said that would be amazing. And then we just sort of thought, "Well, well, let's give it a go." And I think because it was different to Speakeasy, because a because um there was two of us doing it so we could both we could sort of share the workload a bit which made it a bit easier and b because it was in Cholton and it was in a kind of shop rather than a bar it just had a different feel to it so um again so we we, we cracked on with that and uh yeah again it, it, it was quite similar to speakeasy it was it was very kind of small scale community led local um not big and pretentious but just you know neat and um a welcoming and a kind of friendly space for people to come and and read stuff out uh, and it went very well you know we again we were we always had very busy nights um and we got a lot of really good feedback sadly again with <laughs> a year later we've had to stop it um for various reasons um but it might be something that gets resurrected again in the future, potentially. Uh, fingers, but yeah, yeah, fingers crossed. Yeah, fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. You never know what happens. Obviously, um, the other thing, the two things we're going to talk about today, then, really, are because it, mm -hmm. it's, it's handy to do people update what you've been up to. You like, you like us, Dave. You've always got your fingers in lots of pies, basically. Yeah, definitely. That's, yeah. that's definitely one way of putting it. Now, obviously, like, um, you caught me in the man crowd. So was it earlier in the year when you, you announced on Facebook that we saw a launch which we couldn't make? But you were in a short horror film which just come out called Chasm of Lies. Um, yeah. Do you want to tell everybody a bit about that first of all? I'm, yeah. I'm, I want to know the full story behind it because <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Be behind, behind the scenes and it's had in terms of a bundle of lies. Yeah. <laughs> Well, talking of like having fingers in various pies, this was another example of me um, 
you know, one part of my brain saying, you're doing a PhD, you're very, very busy, don't do anything else. And then another part of my brain, when, when someone else comes along and says, do you want to make a short horror film? Goes, <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely, I completely do want to do that, yeah. Um, so this is my friend, uh, my friends Tom, Tom Hammersley and Erin Scally, who are old childhood friends of each other, um, although I've only known, known the pair of them for, for the last sort of six or seven years. Uh, they uh, they used to make horror films, short horror films, when they were students back in college days when they should have been studying. Um, and they wanted to resurrect this and make a new one. And so they uh, asked me and another another Dave if we wanted to get involved. At first, I was supposed to only be involved in a quite a minimal way, like as a sort of bit character, as like a kind of cameo halfway through. Um, but then this very quickly escalated, and I became I'll one of the... You. Yeah, as things do. <laughs> I became one of the core characters and, um, you, could only and you know, had to be at every shoot and like was doing some of the camera work and all sorts of things. But it was a lot of fun and it's really just, it's a very, very, very silly but heartfelt and lovingly made um, comedy horror film. You know, in the sort of vein of, of Scream, it's like a bunch of a bunch of people and they get killed one by one by a masked murderer. Um, it's called Chasm of Lies and it's on YouTube um, and it's great and it, it became a really fun project because it, it, it grew from just being a little sort of thing that we thought we'd just get done within a week or so into something which took us a whole year to make and then Tom bless him he did all the editing he wrote all this um, original music for it um, he put he, he learned how to do like special effects on this bit of uh, video software and added in all of these special effects and it ended up being a really really lovely um, f funny little daft thing and we, we ended up like sort of being so kind of proud of it in, in our own little way that we, uh, we yeah we sort of we hired a, a screen in, in Gulliver's in, in, in the city centre and screened it for um, for an audience which was like I thought it was like a movie premiere which was I thought was quite presumptive of us but people came and really enjoyed it and we had a really great laugh so yeah it's good and if anyone wants to watch it it's up there on YouTube so you don't yeah. tell people about obviously how labour and love it was you were telling somebody mistakes that were deliberately done in the film. Yeah, it's full of, it's just full, I, I, I just love this because it's just full of mistakes all the way through, um, uh, which are just like, we just kept in for the comedy value most of it. Um, and some of it just were just complete mistakes that we didn't even notice until the premiere. But like, there's like things in the background that shouldn't be in there. There's cameras being caught in mirrors. There's... Um, <laughs> Uh, my hair keeps getting longer and shorter. In fact, all of our hairs just keep getting longer and shorter all the way through because we just had a series of haircuts throughout the year. Um, and, you know, daft things like that. And then, like, there was even, there was one scene, we went to uh, Formby Beach to, to film a scene. Um, and it was a really, really windy day, really windy. So, like, when all the footage has just got... <laughs> all over the top of it and you can barely hear what we're saying so the, one of the very last things we did was just thought well those scenes they look really good because they're because it's the beautiful sand dunes and the sea and the beach they looked amazing but you can't really hear what we're saying so we just overdubbed our, our what we were saying so we sort of did a really kind of bad uh, deliberately uh -huh. bad dubbing <laughs> session and for those moments which were, again was really good fun you know just added another joke into the into what was already very jokey silly film so yeah it's good it's good no, i'm looking forward to watching this challenge yourself now the last thing that we need to talk about obviously but is i know there's obviously it's very hard to ask about what's happening in the future we'll come on to that shortly of course but it's, it's your current ep yawn which very yeah. very true to form with you davis and even after we're out of the loop, you, the first thing you do is you're announcing, you're launching it. And I'm trying to set the number. You're doing an EP here. <laughs> first time <laughs> I don't know that <laughs> But yeah. tell us where the idea of you, your spoken word music, and EP Yawn came from. Yeah, okay. So Yawn, um, right. Well, there was a number, of, a number of factors in this, I think, really. But this was... This wasn't something that I'd planned to do for a long, long time. This was kind of triggered by the current... Uh, situation by the lockdown and the coronavirus outbreak and all that kind of thing it was it sort of came about because um when the lockdown came into place and everyone was confined to our homes um you know and as i, I suppose you, you this will resonate with with yourselves um you know yeah, there was a moment where everyone was like like 
we're, we're, I, we need to do something creative here. Like, how can we write about this or how can we react to this in a creative way? And I, I think like many others, actually really struggled. I thought, well, I could, I could sit down and start writing some short stories about, about outbreaks or what have you. But that sort of thing just didn't seem to come together. It seemed to be too, you know, we were t- too much in the storm for it to make any sort of sense. So instead of doing that, I thought, well, I, what I want to do is something, I want to do something with a bunch of um, short stories, mostly flash fictions, actually, that I'd written last year and hadn't really done anything with. So last year, when I was needed a break from the PhD, I would just sit down and write a few little flash fictions and so on. Um, And so I took the kind of the best of those, and I thought, well, I want to do something with these. Um, And then I ended up thinking, well, I'll just, uh, I'll release them in some format. And then the other thing that happened was, again, my friend Tom, who is the same Tom who I made the film with, he um, pointed me in the direction of of an app uh, for my phone, which on the first weekend of the lockdown was made free. And it's a kind of music making app. It's called the KA Oscillator. And you just sort of, you've got a like flashing pad and you press it and it goes, has, has like various drum loops and all the sounds and stuff on it. And I was messing around with this thing and it was like really good fun. I was really, really enjoying it. And I'm not a musician by any stretch at all. Um, but this little app was like, I was making these quite little funky little lo-fi tunes, which I was really enjoying. It's very so good. It's just... straight away. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> you'll pick and like it. I know, I know some music you listen to a lot, and it's yeah. that sort. I could see straight away. I think I told you this one when they played it. I said, "Oh yeah, this is dead straight away." Do it and do straight away with your style. <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah, I mean, I listen to I listen to so much like kind of lo-fi, funky, ambient electronica, and as you, as you do, Andy, you're a big fan of that kind mm-hmm. of um, it, area yeah. as well. <laughs> Yeah, um, so every time you start on Facebook, that's a top of using me and Pat Rover that always chipping in the mix. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, and that's what it's a place to listen to it. But was it quite a lot? Did you do the EP quite quickly? Did it? Did it take yeah, it sort of. So. It did come together quite quickly because, as I say, most of the stories were already written, um, uh, all except for one, which was which was new. But the most of them were 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 already written. The little tunes were easy to easy enough to make on the phone and then take off the phone, and then it was just a matter of gluing them together, really, of recording my my me reading them. So it didn't take long at all. And once I'd like done a, done this a few times and I had a few of them ready, I thought, oh, actually, this is nice. This is kind of this is not quite a. a a kind of it's not quite a flash fiction collection in the traditional sense and it's not quite a musical ep because i'm sort of not tr- saying that i'm a musician necessarily so it was a sort of a, a, a new kind of weird little hybrid form that i quite enjoyed um and so i just smartened it up and gave it a bit of a front cover and 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 stuck it up and my thinking really was i'm just going to put this out there as something an amusing thing for people to listen to um, that might take their minds off the the situation that's happening for half an hour um and it's just a way of me getting some of my my stories out there as well really um yeah so that's what it is it's been out now for well i, I released it officially on saturday and um so it's up there now on Bandcamp, and people can listen to it and download it or if they really want to, they can buy it. They could, they can, they can use some actual physical money to buy it. But you um, wouldn't say no. So I'll give you a couple hundred pounds for a copy and download, would you? <laughs> no, I wouldn't say no. No, <laughs> it's up there as kind of pay what you feel, which is a very broad um, <laughs> category. Oh. So if any billionaires come along and they think, oh, I, I, I feel like paying thousand pounds for it, then that, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, obviously, I know you originally they had a few projects coming up, didn't you? So at the moment, everything's in, up in the air, really, isn't it? And yeah. Telling us off mic before, so your PhD's never done now. I hope that's done in the next few months. And you're hoping to get your novel out then done and out there, aren't you? So, so I'm yeah. guessing that's probably giving you next major project, isn't it? So this novel that's been taking your time for about four years now. Then. Now, in, yeah. in, anything you want to give away about the novel? Um, no, I can talk about it a bit. Um, yeah, so with the novel, it's yeah, it, it's been sort of this novel has been haunting me quite literally for the past uh, four years because this, this is the the big PhD novel. So it's just like I'm submitting this to be like assessed by the university. Um, which is still quite strange. I'm not quite sure how that's going to work, but anyway. Um, so I've been working on it for the past four years, and, and it's very, very nearly ready now. I think it's it, it, my supervisor recently has read through the entire thing and given me some feedback. And so, as soon as I've fixed those bits, it will be pretty much done. 
and I'm hoping then, well, I have to submit it to the uni um, as my as my uh, creative piece for the PhD, but then I'm hoping I will be able to then push that and, and get it out there in some form or get it published. That it's about, um, well, I don't want to say too much, but it, it, my, my whole um, research topic is, is around autism. So, so I have it. Autism, straight away. I mean, tell about that a couple of years yeah. ago. <laughs> Oh, yeah, so um, so my older sister is autistic, and, and it's always been something that I've been really interested in, um, just as a, as a thing, and also creatively. Um, so yeah, I've been trying to. So, so the novel is me, me really trying to write about autism, and the main autistic character in it is based pretty much entirely on my sister. Um, but because like the research has taken me into all sorts of different directions in regard to autism, this novel has changed a lot over the last four years and it's morphed in, into this really strange thing. But it is, it's a, it's a work of sci-fi, I would say, yeah, I would call it science fiction, um, which is really is about autism. So it's, it features lots of various different autistic characters um and yeah and also hopefully it's just like a kind of fun adventure story as well in many ways it's kind of I don't know, having, having, having a copy of your spider scenes book from a couple of years ago that's why yeah. i know i know what your imagination can go like so i know both me and you've got a mantra of spider scenes as well i know we're both looking forward to seeing where this novel you know, seeing you let loose and a full left novel is going to be like I'll yeah, see how, see how crazy it gets. So <laughs> it gets crazy, I tell you, and and like that's part of being what I've been like struggling with is that I've gone too crazy with it at some at some points and had to really rein it back. But anyway, we'll see. Yeah. Can you envision envision yourself then writing the second novel after this, or do you reckon that would just be a one-off of the novels? Um, I think I can. I th there was a point when I was writing this one where I thought, I'll never ever write another novel again. This is horrible. I can't stand <laughs> it. It's, this, this, it's too hard. Um, there's too much to think about, etc. etc. But I'm, I think I'm, I've come through that now. And I think I would definitely um, do another novel. I think next time I write a novel, I will... Try and make a, a, a try and make sure it's a lot simpler than this one. Like this one is quite deliberately complicated and complex, but I think the next one will just be a lot more straight and simple if I if I get to that point. Um, but I still have a really big love for short stories, and like short stories is 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 my bread and butter in many ways. And and I've got a few short stories that I'm working on at the moment that I'd like to develop a little bit more. So it might be that the next thing is a is a possibly might be a full length collection of short stories um potentially but we'll we'll see how it goes it really depends upon uh where the, where this novel goes and what happens with it really obviously where the economy goes at the moment isn't it because i know obviously yeah. before you were telling me weren't you like that you've been obviously had funding come through for doing a workshop didn't you with the art gallery and we can't even really talk yeah. about that today because we just don't know what's going on with that at the moment so it's yeah. very very hard to judge what's going to go on at the moment so anyway dave to conclude and obviously People obviously would know we normally ask the artists to read out some of the pieces in the second half. But I know in your case, we're going to put up two tracks from your EP as it has the tracks to go with this interview. So do you want to tell people about where the origins of the two pieces came from then? From Yawn and yeah. Float. Yawn and Float. Okay, so Yawn is the is the title uh, track for the piece, for the for the title track for the whole EP, obviously it's called the Yawn EP. Um, so Yawn, uh, where does this come from? Okay, yeah. Um, this I wrote last year. Um, this was, was one of those stories that you sort of write at a very idle moment where you just kind of have like a, your brain is just sort of saying, oh, go on, write something and see what comes out. And it was at, I was at Manchester Airport with my wife. We were going to um, Lisbon for a holiday and we were just doing the thing that you do in Manchester Airport, which is just sit around waiting for hours for something to happen. And during that time period, um, the, the two things, two things. One, I sort of spotted a man across, sitting across from me who was yawning constantly all the time. But these big gaping yawns that he was doing and it was catching, catching my attention. And the second thing was that I was reading Ursula Le Guin's Earthsea Quartet. 
um, which is a great series of uh, fantasy novels, um, cl classic series of fantasy novels. And the fantasy and the Earth, the Earth Sea Quartet is all about wizards. Um, and so I sort of just put the two things together. So the story ended up being about a, a wizard at an airport who yawns a lot. <laughs> and it gets very surreal and strange and um, and silly, but also kind of nice and sweet. And and I, it's just a, a one of those stories. That I was like, oh, this is, I, I quite like this. This is this is um, turned out quite well. Um, so that's that one. And then float um, float. I think was the result of yeah. I, the, float was a. There was a competition run uh, last last year where the theme was like water, water and pool, swimming pools and that kind of thing. Um, and so I wrote it for that. I don't think it got anywhere. It didn't place in the competition at all. So then I sort of redrafted it and it just became this story. And really, I don't really know where, it, where the sort of main idea for this came from. It's kind of got a, a, a sort of twist ending, this one. So I kind of will avoid revealing what it's about, but it is about a person who is, who makes a kind of an, an announcement about themselves to a, a, a swimming pool full of people. Um, and I've always been really interested in swimming pools. I find swimming pools really interesting places. Um, I, often, I often find swimming pools end up in my dreams, weirdly. I'm often at swimming pools in my dreams. I don't know what that, psychologically that means. There must be some sort of like reason for it, I'm not sure. I know, um, I don't know Monday has strange dreams. You always tell me that Monday. Oh, yeah. Stranger dreams recently. I can't go into. I've been measured up for coffins and stuff. <laughs> yeah, oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you said the swimming pool. Like, and they always say, don't they? You're doing something about it, and that's what they. It's something about it reflects you. What's on your mind or something very really doesn't it? So, yeah. I think maybe with me, because I, 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 I had this curious thing where I, I didn't learn to swim until I was in my early 20s. I couldn't swim. Uh, mm. and, and, and yet I always really loved going to the swimming, swimming pools, to the swimming baths. I always loved getting in the sea, but I couldn't actually swim for, for many, many years. So I had this weird sort of love-hate relationship with, with swimming pools. And I think that's where it comes through in my dreams, um, because it's like, these because they're always nice places in my dreams but i'm always a slightly anxious of the fact that i'm going to get into the deep end and drown so i think that there is like strange thing going on there but anyway yeah so I, it was just a really nice opportunity then just to sort of to dive in quite literally into this uh theme and yeah and right uh, uh, and it this what's lovely about swimming pools is that there's um there's such strangely sort of unique locations that you can just throw in lots of little bits of detail in there about all sorts of things that you don't see elsewhere and um and get generates a, a, a nice little atmosphere for a story uh so that's what float is and then yeah and it's going to kind of got this twist ending as well which i was quite quite pleased with um and then the bits of music that go with both of them are nothing really more than just me messing around on this app and 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 creating little tunes the one f with float does have a kind of watery sound to it i think um <laughs> yeah Cool. Well, I said it's worth checking out, guys. It's a great, it's very Davis EP. It's a great way. It's got that sort of homage to that, the way his musical taste is well worth taking time. Now, Dave, if you want people to find out more about you, obviously, you, I know you've got your website, haven't you? So, what's your website for people to check out then? So, my website is uh, davidhartleywriter.com. Um, and that's got um, pretty much everything on it, and it's got links to some online stories and bits and pieces about me and my projects and things, various things I've been up to um, over the years and a blog as well. And then I, I'm also reasonably active on Twitter where I'm uh, at D Hartley writer. Um, and that's where people can find me. D Hartley writer, yeah, on Twitter. And obviously we're, obviously we're talking about your Bandcamp page where you can get hold of your tracks. So is yes. it that David Hartley writer at Bandcamp? Right no, that's not got the writer bit in it. That's just davidhartley.bandcamp.com. That was it. And yeah, I, knew, I, knew, I, knew, I knew I had a feeling like that wrong with that. So brilliant for that, Dave. Well, I said, we're going to put the tracks up as a part two. So that's all my questions for today. But thank you, Dave. It's been a pleasure. Right. As always, hang around. We need to put me and Mandy to quit with you off mic. But this is yep. as always, Dave. It's been great fun today. See you. Thank you again. And I'll see you all soon, guys. Take care. Thank you very much. Spock on me.
thought it would be impossible to find the Archmage at the airport, but the advice was right. I'd know him when I saw him. It was the man in the Manchester United shirt, the one who yawned so wide that people would be swallowed whole every time he opened that gaping void. It began with his own family at check-in. Yawn. There went his son. Another yawn. In fell his weary wife. He still had his daughter and newborn when I saw him next in the lounge, but there had been quite the delay to our flight to Malaga, so yawn. There went the baby like a rag doll in laundry, and yawn. Off went the daughter, despite her best efforts to clean the sides. Once he was alone, he finally noticed me. We opened our mind link. Now I could interpret his every movement. With a scratch of his stubble and a sly picking of his nose, he divined the futures of each plane we could see. A crash, a hijack, an extraterrestrial heist. I held Mum's hand as I awaited the fate of our own flight, but he didn't tell it. Later, as we approached the steps to embark, it happened. You. The mightiest yet. Our plane buckled, squeaked, slid, and we all tumbled in. There was turbulence for a while, but the pilot got a handle on it. We flew for hours through the Archmage's gullet in almost total darkness. I didn't panic. I concentrated. A cantrip of soothing for Mum. A charm of binding around the fuselage. Before long, we landed and disembarked. Mum chucked our rough guide to Malaga down his duodenum. Well, we're here now, she said, with her magic smile. We'll just have to make the best of it. Spoken me. She climbed onto the float, got her balance, and made her announcement to the pool. Only a few heard it. The lifeguards, of course, who blinked from their daydreams, and the giggly teens in the shallow end. She waited, knees wobbling, until swimmers stopped mid-stroke to stare, until goggles were lifted and dive bombs were hesitated. She announced it again, louder, prouder. Water dripped a rhythm from her fingers to the float. She said it once more for those at the back. The settling wakes of swimmers rocked beneath her. She hadn't known it was possible to balance on a float. Didn't know they could hold a person's weight. She dared not move. She didn't want to fall back in until they decided. Applause. She grinned. She blushed. Two breaststrokers glided over and steadied her platform. One of the teens asked her to say it again, so she did. Whoops and cheers, clapping, which became splashing. The dive bomber jumped for joy and plunged. The lifeguards blew up inflatables and pushed them out. The front crawlers unhooked the ropes and lashed together a throne of squeaky plastics, a palace of air. They asked for her life story and she told it. They asked for more, so she embellished, performed. The pool filled when word got out. A queue formed. She told fortune. But as sudden as it started, her time was done. She popped the valves and let the escaping air flop her back into the waters. Only a few acolytes remained. She gave them a rubber ring each to remember her by. She pushed her weary legs to the ladder and climbed out. She showered got her belongings from her locker, and when she reached the doors to the changing room, he turned left. Thanks again for listening to another session of the Spoken Label. Our full archive can be found over on Bandcamp at Spoken 
label, that's one word, spoken label, full stop, bandcamp.com. And there is over 150 sessions there. So I'm sure that if you've enjoyed this session, there'll be something else there you can enjoy as well. Take care. Bye-bye. Spoken label.